We're going to read the account of Palm Sunday. It actually occurs in all four Gospels, but I'd like to read Matthew's account this morning. Matthew chapter 21 is where you will find it. I'd like to read it. If you wish to follow along, you may. Uh, I'd ask you to stand, if please, as we read. Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Thank you. You may be seated. Lord, the story is familiar to us, and yet there's always something new we can learn, or some freshness that you can bring to the story in our, in our minds, in our hearts, and so, Lord, help us to consider this event and what you would want to teach us today from it. Speak to us in these moments, I pray, in Christ's name, amen. I think it was a comedian, Mel Brooks, who coined the phrase, it's good to be the king. And when he said that, I'm sure that he thought, as many of us do, about what comes with being a king. All of the trappings that would come. The rights and the privileges, the authority and the power, the riches and the glory Uh, servants doing your every bidding, all of those things. It's good to be the king. Sounds like a good life. And throughout history, there have been many who have aspired to be king in whatever nation they were a part of, but many times by any means necessary, even if that meant the assassination of the present king. Oh, to be king. Kings very seldom willingly relinquish their throne, and you can understand why. In the British monarchy, as you know, it's only happened once that we can think of, at least in modern times, where a king has willingly given up their throne. I'm sure Prince Charles would kind of like his mother to follow suit, but that's a whole other issue. But this morning... I want us to consider the many, one of the many titles that is given to Jesus in the Scriptures, and that is the title of King. The Bible teaches us that Jesus is the King, not just a King, but the King, the King of Kings, the King above all other Kings. Which is very interesting because if in your mind you picture what you think a king looks like, and then you picture in your mind the typical, usual representations of what Jesus looked like, there's a disconnect there, isn't there? Most of the pictures or the paintings or the imaginations of the, of the artists over the years have pictured Jesus as a very common ordinary-looking Palestinian Jewish male of that particular time. And that is probably accurate. 
because his life on earth was not lived as a king might live. His life on earth was lived humbly. He didn't live in a palace. He didn't have a bunch of servants do his bidding. He had followers, but not servants. He had no finery. There were no pretensions. Jesus might not have looked very much like a king during his time on earth, but make no mistake, though he might not have looked the part, he certainly was and is king. Today is Palm Sunday, and it begins the most important week of the year in the Christian world, called Passion Week, or most often Holy Week. The word holy means to set apart, to make something sacred. And so this week is set apart because we celebrate and remember and contemplate the last week of Jesus' earthly life and all of the events. We give attention to his passion. We think about the Last Supper, for instance, and his time in Gethsemane and his arrest by the Jewish authorities, in his trials before the Jewish authorities, before Pilate, and then his conviction, and his torture, and his execution, and his burial. Thankfully, that's not where the story ends, because then we also celebrate his victorious resurrection from the dead, All of those events begin with the one we remember today, the entry into Jerusalem. It's a really interesting event on so many levels. It's both a scripted event and an unscripted event. It's scripted in the fact that Jesus obviously planned his entry. He told his disciples where to go to get the colt and to ride into the city on that cult. It was, he wanted to come in in a very, very specific, different way. But it was unscripted too, because as he came in, apparently the crowd gathered and more and more and more and excitement grew and grew and cloaks were being thrown on the way and palm branches being waved and thrown before him. And this marvelous exaltation, this praise, this adoration of Jesus, this proclamation of him being king. At that particular point, it was the Passover time, and there were literally thousands of -of out-of-towners in Jerusalem. Thousands of people making their way into the gates. But it was only Jesus' entry that was... It, that, that, that made this kind of reaction. It made it different. Make no mistake, this was a happening in Jerusalem. You couldn't have ignored that it happened. If they had the technology, it would be the leading story in the newscast of the evening or the headline in the newspaper. What was going on here? Why did Jesus enter that way. Why did he orchestrate that? Why did he accept the praises of the people? It just seems so out of character. Jesus seemed to act so humbly when he was here on earth. There are many times when crowds got all excited after a miracle or something else, and he he would just slip away. He didn't want the adulation. He didn't want it to be lifted up as king. And now here, he seems to encourage it and revel in it. I believe the key to understanding Palm Sunday, as well as the key to understanding all of the events that we're going to remember and celebrate this week, is this whole concept of Jesus' identity as king. All of the events of Holy Week really have to do with Jesus' kingship. And if you don't understand Jesus as king, then you cannot understand really what's going on here 
But before we look at those events, let me just give you the big picture. The fact that Jesus is king is consistent in the biblical teaching from beginning to end. Do you remember when Mary was given the word by the angel that she was going to bear a child? Gabriel said to Mary, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign with Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Throne, reign, kingdom. Mary was being told right at the outset that this child that you're going to deliver is a king, the king. And you remember the magi, the wise men? When they came after Jesus was born, following the star, we know the whole story. What was it they were looking for? According to the scriptures, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We've seen his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. From the very beginning of Jesus' appearance here on earth, It was all about his being king. Let's go to the end. You go to the book of Revelation, and what do we see? We see the wonderful picture of Jesus in the heavenlies. And we are told, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then we're told that the angels sing, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We can honestly say from beginning to end, Jesus is king. In all of the time in between those things, that didn't change. So in order to understand the big picture, and especially what's going on on Holy Week, you need to understand Jesus is king. Was king, is king, will be king forever and ever. Jesus is king. Now let's look at these Holy Week things. How does that play itself out? Well, the triumphal entry. What's going on here is Jesus is presenting himself to Jerusalem the capital, the center of Jewish life. He's presenting himself as their king. In Psalm 24, a messianic psalm, we read these words, Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you everlasting doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, the king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. He's talking about Jerusalem, the gates of Jerusalem, that there's going to come a time when the king of glory will come in. And then as Matthew mentions, there's a very specific verse in the prophecy in the Old Testament in Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, (coughs) lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It is prophesied that the king, when he comes into Jerusalem, will be riding on what? A donkey. Why do you think Jesus asked his disciples to go get a donkey? Jesus has been coming to Jerusalem his whole life. My guess is never once did he ride because people generally didn't do that. Men didn't do that. Why did Jesus insist on going in this particular fashion this time? He is presenting himself intentionally, identifying himself with this prophetic picture, telling the people at the time, I am your king. I am the fulfillment of what you have been waiting for. I am king. I am Messiah. And what's amazing is that people get it. Because what do they say? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're using the language of the day to indicate, yes, you are our king. And Jesus' enemies get it too. 
because they're not happy about this. The Jewish authorities were not happy that Jesus was identifying himself as their king. They understood perfectly what Jesus was saying because they tell him, rebuke your disciples. Stop it. You can't let this happen. And, of course, Jesus says, if you tried to stop it, the rocks themselves would cry out. This one time, Jesus, when he entered Jerusalem, you could say, looked like a king. And it was intentional. But you go through the week that follows, and what do you see? You see Jesus and his kingship being questioned and ultimately bringing him to the cross. When Jesus is arrested by the Jewish leaders and they send him to Pilate, there's a little bit of an interesting byplay between Pilate and Jesus. It's in John chapter 18. Verse 33, Pilate says to Jesus, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Pilate said, you are a king then. And Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Direct answer from Jesus to Pilate. You are a king then? Yes, Jesus replies. That becomes the basis ultimately of his conviction. And then if you continue to read, the fact that he's king brings on his torture. Chapter 19 of John. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Soldiers were mocking him. Why? Because he said he was their king. And that's not all. He then suffered the rejection of his own people. And why was he rejected? Again, John 19. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Think about that. He was being accused, Jesus, of blasphemy. There was the blasphemy. The chief priests were saying a pagan emperor was their king. They hated the pagan emperor. But they said so in order to reject Christ. And then, of course, we come to the crucifixion a little later on. And what do we find again from John 19? Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Everyone that day who saw it was there 
and saw the cross, whether it was the Roman soldiers, whether it was those who loved him or those that hated him, they all saw the sign of over his head that said what? Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. You cannot read the Passion story without King being an essential part all the way through. Of course, we know that's not the end of the story. We see it also in the resurrection, which validates his claim to be king. And his later ascension, where he sits where? The right hand of God, the Father in heaven on high. And we understand that his kingship is present today as he reigns in the life of of his lives of his people and the life of his church. And we know that his reign will someday be absolute, totally complete. And those of us who know him will stand before him, or should I say kneel before him, or maybe more appropriately be prostrate before him and proclaim him as King of kings and Lord of lords that he is. So how do you treat a king? You honor a king. That's worship. That's what we've been doing this morning. We've been honoring our king. And hopefully that is not only when we get together in a group, but we honor him always. And what else do you do with a king? You obey a king. You recognize his authority. And so we acknowledge Jesus as king by doing what he says, living how he tells us to live, following his commands. How else do you treat a king? You serve a king. You serve his interests. You accomplish his purposes. As I was thinking about this this week, I I really thought that the title Holy Week could very well be replaced and just call it King Week. It's King Week, and it starts today with Palm Sunday. All through this week, as we read the story, as we consider it, Jesus is going to be front and center presented to us as King. You can't ignore it. You can't get away from it. You can't pretend it's not there. It is front and center in the accounts. And at times this week, he will look anything but like a king. But make no mistake, he is king. His suffering, even his suffering, was a victory. It was the victory over sin and death and the devil. Jesus is king. That is a fact. You can choose to believe that or not believe it. but That doesn't change the fact that he is king. The question for us is, since Jesus is king, how shall we respond? By honoring him, obeying him, serving him, acknowledging him, recognizing him. We don't make him king, but we do allow him to be king of our lives. As we go through this week together, and as we go on with our lives, when you think of Jesus, and there's so many ways to think about him, and they're all valid, but for this week perhaps, more than any other. Let's think about him as king. Jesus is our king. King of kings. Lord of lords. When you leave here today, you're going to be given a little palm frond to take with you. Let that be your reminder this week. Why the palms? Because they were throwing them before. Why? To acknowledge Jesus as king. That palm frond, every time you see it, wherever you put it, may it remind you. 
that Jesus is king. Amen? Heavenly Father, thank you for this week. We proclaim Jesus today and always as our king, as the king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. May we see Jesus this week. I pray this in his name. Amen.